by this time tomorrow, we'll have a new government, but you can take a peek into the ups and downs of the next few years of regional policy by taking a short trip to Huddersfield. I'm David Tame, Analysis Editor at Place North. In today's Place podcast, we'll look at how a new government can learn from West Yorkshire's wonderland. We'll also take a look at investors positioning themselves for a tight market for big sheds and wonder if property's romance with private equity funding is turning sour. Something is going on around Huddersfield, and it's wonderful. Economic growth and lots of it. Research by the Northern Powerhouse Partnership shows economic output per hour worked soaring in Huddersfield and its hinterland in a way it doesn't anywhere else in West Yorkshire and hardly anywhere else in the north. The figures speak for themselves. Between 2004 and 2022, GDP per hour worked in Kirklees and Calderdale rose by 25.7%. That's a little under the 33.7% recorded in powerhouse Manchester, and I mean the city, not the city region. But it's miles ahead of almost everyone else. For comparison, Bradford scored a very healthy 17%, but way beneath Kirklees and Calderdale. Leeds scored 11%, disappointing, and Wakefield had a struggle to reach 2%. So why the surge? The answer is another number. There are currently only about 10,000 working people in the north who can get to the region's four big cities and Manchester Airport in less than an hour, and they all live in or around Huddersfield. Moreover, the idea of becoming one of those 10,000 or so lucky souls is very appealing to urbanites from Manchester and Leeds. I spoke to one relocator, Font Communications boss Rebecca Eatwell. She moved from Chalton Cum Hardy in South Manchester to Huddersfield's richly rail served hinterland in 2009. In her village, emigre Mancunians and Leeds dwellers are behind all kinds of new stuff a fancy new kid's shop, a smart diner and plenty more. They've been transformational. Huddersfield's economic growth has got everything to do with the connectivity that drew Rebecca there, says Northern Powerhouse Partnership Chief Executive Henry Morrison, because it shows that connectivity makes towns more prosperous. He has commissioned more research to prove the point, and if you could only do one thing to boost regional growth, then you should improve connectivity, he says. Is a potential Labour government promising the surge of infrastructure investment, which this connectivity-first approach implies? Well, the answer is not precisely. Now, you've got a couple of seconds here when you can uh, twiddle your thumbs or look out of the window. I'm going to read the relevant passage of the Labour Manifesto. It says, A Labour government will develop a 10-year infrastructure strategy aligned with our industrial strategy and regional development priorities, including improving rail connectivity across the north of England. The strategy will guide investment plans and give the private sector certainty about the project pipeline. We will work closely with businesses to map and address the delivery challenges we face. We will create a new National Infrastructure and Service Transformation Authority, bringing together existing bodies to set strategic infrastructure priorities and oversee the design, scope and delivery of projects. That's the end of the quote. Cynics note that this is mostly about writing things. Delivery is mentioned at the very end of the list and no funding is promised. In Labour-run Kirklees, most of those who head the regeneration effort are inclined to put the best possible construction on the manifesto's promises, but they nonetheless insist that better transport infrastructure means more growth. Those relocators include Commuters, like Rebecca, once regarded with some hesitation, but now wholeheartedly embraced. I spoke to the former Kirklees council leader and now chair of Huddersfield Unlimited, the town's cheerleading body, Sir John Harmon. He says there was once a question about whether they wanted to grow commuter hinterland. But with working from home, there's no longer a choice between wealth creation and commuting economies. It's a false choice, he says, the town can do both. Along with connectivity, Sir John suggests some weekend and evening cultural assets, a few more restaurants, some entertainment, would help cement the town's reputation as West Yorkshire's wonderland. Kirklees Council already have that cultural and lifestyle problem in hand. Uh, Part of what is badged as a £1 billion investment in the town. 
In June last year, Kirkley selected BAM BAM to deliver the first phase of Our Cultural Heart, a comprehensive revamp of the town centre. The project involves the refurbishment of the former Queensgate Market and Huddersfield Library buildings to house a food hall and a museum and a gallery. And that's not the end of it. In March this year, the council allocated £16.7 million of levelling up funding, accepted a further £48 million for the Penistone rail line upgrade, another £20 million for Dewsbury, which has all of Huddersfield's locational advantages but hasn't yet struck gold, and £17 million for an investment zone. Add all that up, it's big stuff. But will there be more dosh under a new government? Unless we've all been seriously deceived, potential Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves, will not be unveiling a torrent of infrastructure spending in her October budget. But will we see a maintenance of the existing regime of investment zones, enterprise zones and levelling up funding? Sir John says that if funding of the Trans-Pennine Rail upgrade, investment zones or levelling up were to be hacked back or changed direction, the town would lose momentum. Insiders say that as an alternative to spending, July will see an announcement for Angela Rayner on planning reform and green belt land. Will this kickstart growth in the way infrastructure spending might? Well, it's not unwelcome, but it's not exactly setting hearts racing. If you could only do one thing to help the North's economy, you'd do connectivity, says Henry Morrison of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. We've gone on to say that improving connectivity opens up far more sites for housing, so you win both ways. The North's problem isn't so much that you can't get a decent house at a reasonable price, but the wages are below the average in places that aren't well connected, he says. Does Huddersfield need more land? Well, it's hard to say. A 2020 employment land review uh, was undertaken but never published, so we go back to the 2019 version which showed there were small pockets of employment land south of Huddersfield and about 96 acres of employment land in the town itself. A 2023 report suggests Kirklees was using up employment land at roughly the rate it was being provided. But bear in mind that most of the commercially interesting logistics sites are north of the town in Calderdale Borough. Housing land is also running a little short. A May 2024 report suggests that the five-year housing land supply had dropped to a 3.96 year housing land supply. Now, it's not a crisis, but it's a move in the wrong direction. The problem, of course, is topography. Large flat sites are rare in West Yorkshire. Calderdale has agreed to two large urban extensions, which will do some of the work, and developers are sent to have plenty of extra options up their sleeves. So, the outcome. I spoke to Savills director Simon Douglas, and he said it's not either or, Huddersfield needs both the infrastructure and the land. By this time tomorrow, we'll probably have a new government. The unusually rapid pace of growth in Huddersfield ought to attract its immediate attention. Very soon, we'll find out if it has. And now your regular rundown of what's going up and what's heading the other way in the Place North elevator. Doors closing, going up. You may have been reading about the Greater Manchester Combined Authority preparing to defend its decision to allocate 508 million of its 942 million housing investment fund to just one developer, Renica. A case will appear before the Competition Appeals Tribunal fairly soon. But spare a thought for other property lenders with looming headaches of their own, then pause to consider how much pain this could mean for Northern real estate and people like you. The mood isn't brilliant. Deals are taking a long time. Funders are hesitant. The property market is sticky and samey. It feels like 2023 all over again. And the total volume of lending to commercial property has fallen off a cliff. It hasn't been this low since 2013, just as the UK began to recover, if it ever really did recover from the great financial crash. At the same time, about £71 billion of the roughly £170 billion of outstanding loans will have to be refinanced within the next 12 months. That's according to the Bayes Business School, who keep their eye on this kind of thing. 
you can do the equation yourself. A credit famine plus urgent need to refinance equals distress. So far, private equity has stepped in when others have pulled back, accounting for about 20% of commercial property lending. But that's not necessarily a good thing, as last week's Bank of England Financial Stability Report pointed out. They said that private equity's high leverage, fuzzy valuations, and what they call, quote, strong interactions with riskier credit markets, close quotes, pose a risk, which could spill over into other parts of the finance sector and could be exaggerated by further spillover from turmoil in the very much wobblier US private equity sector. As it happens, lately private equity has swerved away from commercial real estate and opted instead for for city living. We've got uh, Singapore-based Q Investment Partners, uh, active at Merrion Street in Leeds and Kane International with their US links at First Street in Manchester. But the commercial sector hasn't been abandoned by private equity. Oh no, the largest recent private equity buy was New York-based equity giant KKR buying shed plots at Omega Warrington. And before then, we had the unexpected arrival of Luxembourg-based Parthena Ray, believed to have paid something north of £70 million for an office block at 1 Hardman Boulevard, Manchester. So they're active. If you think interest rates aren't going to drop soon, and that the UK's ballooning public sector debt isn't going to let it drop very far when it does begin to fall, then the gradual ratcheting up of private equity risk seems unavoidable. But without the liquidity private equity helps to provide, it's going to be hard to get much built, whoever sits in 10 Downing Street. Tuesday morning this week saw two announcements, one from Bearings and one from Panatoni, both announcing the purchase of a 65-acre site on the A1M, and neither mentioning the other. By studying the pictures, you could work out that they were, in fact, talking about the same site. Inquiries later revealed the buy was funded by the former and developed by the latter. The splendid media cock-up, their expression not mine, heralds what is trumpeted as the North's largest speculative development in the form of a 770,000-square-foot building on a site consented for one point. 2 million square feet. Work is due for completion by September next year. The media confusion is emblematic of a funny, unsettled industrial scene. Data from Cushman and Wakefield shows that investors are abandoning the shed sector. Q1 2024 data showed investment volumes down 35% on the five-year average. When investors decide to splurge, it tends to be modest, meaning they spend less than 50 million Take up in any case is down 12% on the fairly poor showing of late 2023. None of this is good. So, why buy the Junction 34 site today? What was going through the minds of Bearings and Panatoni? Well, there might just might be a few fractions of decimal points of yield gap to exploit between the north of England and the south. But the story is more simple than that. They're simply now being a good location that occupies love in a market which they hope by late 2025 could be running out of the new big boxes that many occupiers yearn for. Known demand for big sheds is beginning to creep back up. Nothing to get giddy about, don't get excited, but at 4.7 million square feet, this is the highest it's been for 18 months. Meanwhile, supply is edging down, with the stock of available sheds sliding by 3% in the first quarter of this year. It's not a lot, but it's something. Investor activity is relatively more visible in the north than in the trickier south, and we have to bear that in mind as well. The north looks like a slightly better bet. The real winner here, of course, is the vendor of that A1M unit, Mulberry Developments, who picked up a lovely, hope-filled moment to unload a good quality plot. As summer turns to autumn, the mood might not always be so bright. That's it for today. We've made a happy visit to Huddersfield, West Yorkshire's wonderland, to see what a new government could learn. Glanced at private equity lending to property, which begins to look a bit fragile, and seen investor interest in the big shed sector perk up just a little. For more about the built environment in the north, visit placenorth.co.uk. I'm David Tame, and thank you for listening.